In their story about the explosion of the Omar D. Conger, the Port Huron Times Herald, on March 27, 1922, ran the following statement made by an enthusiastic member of the public. Quote, I don't see how people can go out pleasure riding this afternoon when they have a wreck like this to look at, said a spectator Sunday afternoon. He went on to say that he had notified all his friends that he could reach by telephone, taking several of them to the scene in his car, and was returning to the spot for the fifth time to explore it fully the third time. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The Scattered Pieces of the Omar D. Conger. Here we are. Enjoy! The Omar D. Conger was 40 years old by the time of its explosive end, having originally been built in 1882 for Morat and Runnels. The men who ran the ferry line between Port Huron, Michigan, and Sarnia, Ontario. It was a small 199 ton wooden propeller steam vessel, built with only the ferry route in mind. It was a busy and popular route, and it would eventually fall under a company, the Port Huron Sarnia Ferry Company, which took over ownership of the Omar D. Conger as well as several other ships in 1891. The ship would lead a fairly uneventful life, except for one blip. It would burn while at the dock on Black River, Port Huron, Michigan, in June 1901. The Omar D. Conger was raised fairly quickly and was put back into service, carrying up to 800 passengers in each direction. There would be nothing else that would put the Omar D. Conger in the news until late March 1922 when the Omar D. Conger would shake the city. It was reported that the Omar D. Conger was a well-maintained ship, with very little remaining of the original ship that had first sailed 40 years before. In 1904, a new boiler was installed, and during the winter of 1921 into 1922, the Omar D. Conger was laid up and underwent extensive rebuilding. The decks were rebuilt, and the engine was overhauled, all in expectation of the coming season. It went back into service on the 11th of February. The Omar D. Conger was on a later shift in the ferry service, taking passengers from Port Huron to Sarnia and back, from 3 p.m. to around midnight. She had done this route without incident on Friday the 24th of March, and after unloading her last passengers at the Black River dock of Port Huron at midnight. She was not due to go back into service until Sunday the 26th. On Saturday the 25th, routine maintenance was done on the ship's boilers with the ship's engineer as well as someone from the Pioneer Boiler Works. They found a few leaks and did repairs. In the afternoon of the 26th, the crew began to gather on the Omar D. Conger to prepare for the first trip of the day. By 2.20 p.m., four of the members of the crew were present and had already gotten to work. These were Campbell, who was the ship's engineer, Althaus, who was the ship's fireman, and two deckhands named Buckner and Crandall. The two members of the crew were running behind schedule. Captain Major was close by, but still walking to work. Meanwhile, Assistant Engineer Busby had missed the trolley from his home and therefore was running very behind his expected time. Though there was still over half an hour to departure time for the ferry, the passengers had already started gathering at the deck, though none of them had boarded the ship yet. The city of Sheboygan, another ship in the ferry line, under the command of Captain Waugh, was just approaching the dock from Sarnia with 200 passengers on board. Captain Waugh was on the bridge of his ship, but was not looking at the Omar de Conger until he suddenly heard an explosion. He would later give his first-hand account to the newspapers. I heard the explosion and looked up and saw a cloud of smoke and dust where the Conger had been. I was deafened and sort of dazed for a few seconds, and the next thing I saw was her hull and sinking debris 
was scattered all around. My first thought was that anyone on her was gone. Then I looked around to see that my boat was not damaged. No one on her was hurt. It is a good thing that the explosion didn't occur five minutes later, or some of our 200 passengers would have been injured. They would have been walking out of the ferry house where the debris was flying, and one of the automobiles would probably have been where the lifeboat landed. In front of Captain Wah's eyes, the Omar de Conger sank in an instant. The 25-ton boiler had blown itself through the hull of the ship, leaving a gaping hole in her side that took on water quickly. Captain Wah was not able to see the details due to the cloud of smoke and splinters that had filled the air with the explosion. Captain Wah proved to be correct in multiple regards, however. The people on the Omar de Conger were all lost. The remains of the deckhands, Buckner and Crandall, were found on a coal pile, while the other two were trapped in the hull of the sunken ship. Captain Wah was also right that the raining debris of the Omar de Conger was a serious risk to the safety of those on shore. All around the city, there would be reports of near misses and injuries. But, amazingly, the only people to be lost would be the four who had been on the ship when it exploded. Sitting in a car parked outside of the ferry building were a young man and woman who were waiting for the city of Sheboygan to come in. They could not see what had happened because the ferry building blocked their view, but one of the Omar de Conger's lifeboats flew through the air over the roof of the ferry building and landed only two feet from their car. Pieces of asbestos from the Conger's steam pipes soon followed and bounced off of their vehicle. The two people in the car were unharmed, however, and once they got out to see what had happened, they found everything quiet, as though nothing had ever happened. They joined many other people in walking towards the dock to investigate. In Albert A. Fox undertaking parlor, about 600 feet from the dock, a funeral was taking place when, without any warning, the Omar D. Conger's 200-pound radiator hurtled through the rear window of the chapel before landing like a bomb in the midst of the mourners who had gathered with a shower of splinters and broken glass. It was accompanied by a piece of telegraph pole that had been carried in by the radiator. One woman had her shoulder broken and ribs fractured. Another woman had her nose broken, while yet another was said to have lost vision in one of her eyes due to the flying glass. One prominent couple from Ontario was reported to have been very badly cut by the broken glass, to the extent that they were listed to have been the people on shore most injured by the explosion. Captain Major, who was still walking to join the Omar de Conger for the day, was very close to the chapel, and had the unenviable experience of watching his ship's radiator crash into the building. One of the ship's beams, which was described as needing five men to lift it, was hurled into the alley behind the funeral chapel, and the needle from the ship's steam gauge was found in the funeral parlor during cleanup. Doctors were immediately called into the chapel to treat the wounded, and then the funeral was finished, though it was admittedly truncated. Even the mourners, who had not been injured, were in deep shock and it was decided it would be best to head to the cemetery as quickly as possible. The red-hot boiler of the Omar de Conger had also become a dangerous missile. W.G. Jenks, who owned an auto shop about 100 feet from the dock, had a terrible experience of seeing the still-glowing boiler heading in his direction. Fortunately for him, it flew over his shop and crashed down into the house across the street from him. The house immediately caught fire. The house in question belonged to the Smith family, who just so happened to have purchased themselves a new automobile that week. It being the first weekend since the purchase, the whole family had decided to pile into the car and drive to Yale, Michigan to enjoy their new vehicle. The Smith family was very frustrated when, on the trip back from Yale, their new car got so stuck in the mud that they were not able to free it and so they were forced to call on a local farmer to tow them out. It was a painful and disappointing delay for the family, who were eager to return home to enjoy their chicken dinner, 
that had already been prepared as a way to finish the anticipated family trip. The family rushed home to enjoy that dinner, to find only the smoldering remains of their home. Only a very small part of their kitchen was still standing. The fire had not only burned their home completely, but it had also begun to spread to the neighboring home. This, the fire department was able to stop, and only one wall of the neighboring home was damaged. But the home that the Smiths lived in was an entire loss. The Smiths were the first to admit that it had been a lucky thing that they had been caught in the mud. Without the delay, they would have been at home sitting down to dinner, with no idea of the danger that they were in. All across the city, more stories of near misses and property damage came pouring in. The anchor crashed through a building on the opposite side of the Black River and embedded itself in a brick wall. The Hiawatha, another ferry in the line, was anchored nearby and had the planks on her deck ripped off by the force of the explosion. A 2 by 8 beam hurtled through the window of the Hill and Porter Sales Company building went right between two men who were standing in the store and went through another wall before coming to a stop. It was found that only one window in the building had survived the force of the explosion at the Port Huron Press office. Two newspaper workers were lucky to be out of their usual office when the Omar D. Conger's boiler tubes came through the rear wall of the building. One man was pouring metal for stereotyping and the other had just passed into another room for a moment when the tubes crashed through the wall in a shower of flying bricks. A slice bar used for clinkers in the Omar D. Conger's boiler went through the wall of Peg's tire shop across the Black River from the dock. One of the lifeboat davits also came crashing through Peg's tire shop. It traveled through the roof of the building and through a wall before coming to rest plunged into the brick facade at the front of the building where it hung over the street. Looking to make the best out of the situation, the owner of the tire shop said that he would use it to hang a tire sign from. A Boy Scout meeting was cut short due to the blast, and the Boy Scouts were told to go home early. One of the members of the troop passed a shop he had once worked at and noticed that the windows were blown out, and worrying about the clothing that was hanging in the windows getting damaged, he climbed through the broken pane of glass took the clothing from the window, and, after laying it on the counter, exited the shop again. The broken windows in a two-block radius of the blast were definitely the most commonly reported damage from the explosion, though, as is often the case, there were some reports that were called into question and some speculation of fraudulent claims. There was also a deep concern, with every person who had not been seen when expected speculated to have fallen victim to the explosion. The fatality count was initially reported to be higher by at least two before it was proven that the Omar D. Conger had only taken its crew with it. The owner of the ferry company, former Congressman McMorrin, was quickly on the scene to oversee the search of the wreckage of the ferry, and he told the papers that the men who had been on the ferry were all good men whose loss he deeply mourned far more than the loss of the ship. Mick Morin was not the only person overseeing the cleanup. People had soon flocked from all over Port Huron and beyond, in the thousands to see the wreckage of the ship and the cleanup. The ferries were still carrying people back and forth from Sarnia in spite of the accident, and since in Sarnia, the sound of the explosion was, if anything, even more clear. People from Sarnia were soon also rushing to the scene. This posed a whole new danger. Tangled in the wreckage were many live electrical wires. The cross arms and top portion of an electrical pole hung suspended by the other wires for two hours after the explosion. And to the alarm of the Detroit Edison Company, the curious crowd passed under it without paying any attention to warnings. The response by the power company was swift. It was reported that within minutes, they had dispatched 30 men to try to sort out the live wires and try to keep the public from danger, frequently in spite of the best efforts of the public. It would not be until 8 p.m. that night that they had everything powered again, 
but this was considered very fast work considering the scope of the damage. The inquest into the disaster was held at Falk Funeral Chapel, the same funeral parlor that had been a victim of the blast. The boiler tubes, which had been pulled from the wall of the press building, were the most closely examined piece of evidence, and they were found to tell a convincing story. It was found that they seemingly had been heated to a very high heat without water in them. With the maintenance of the day before the explosion in mind, a theory was formed. It seemed as though the boiler had been fired up to get ready for the day's trips. And, without the crew realizing it, when the boiler was fired up, it was dry. This should have been known by Campbell, the engineer, who had participated in the repairs of the day. He was described as a careful man, though Captain Waugh of the city of Sheboygan would say all engineers were careful, because they had the knowledge that a mistake could blow them sky high. It is possible that Campbell was not the one who made the fire in the boiler, though. There is no way of knowing. There is also no way of knowing who made what was most likely the next mistake. That on realizing that the boiler had no water in it, Someone opened the cock, pouring cold water into the already glowing boiler. That was something that would definitely produce the explosive results that were seen. The damage to the city of Port Huron was estimated to be around $150,000 in total, and that did not include the estimated $75,000 value of the Omar D. Conger itself, which did not carry boiler insurance, and was therefore a total loss. The Omar D. Conger would be raised, but this time there was no chance of a second life. The explosion had torn it in two, and both pieces of the hull would be towed out into deeper water in Lake Huron and sank, having left a lasting impact on Port Huron. For more information, please see the Federal Reporter Second Series of Cases Argued and Determined in the Circuit Court of Appeals November 1924 to January 1925, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.